Um, good evening everyone. Um, it's now 7pm and I'd like to start the meeting of the General Services Committee. Um, I'd like to remind everyone present that the meeting is being live streamed and recorded. Item 1, apologies for absence. I've received the apologies of Councillor um, Deb Arnold um, and Councillor Ben Maney will be substituting for her. Are there any other apologies? No apologies, Chair. Thank you. Um, item 2, um, the approval of the of the Public General Services Committee meeting um, on June the 23rd and the 5th of July 2023 committees. Do I have approval for those, me those minutes? Agreed. Agreed, yeah, thank you. Um, item three, urgent items of business. I've not agreed to any item of urgent business. Declaration of interest, item four. Does anyone wish to declare a declaration of interest? No? Thank you. Okay, so item five, which is employment matters, senior management arrangements. Can I just remind members that Appendix 3 is um, exempt, and should you wish to discuss that, we will need to go into exempt session. Um, but apart from that, we can... Um, um, discuss all of the matters. So can I ask um, Dr Dave Smith to present this report please? Thank, thank you Chair. Um, at the last meeting of the General Services Committee you received a report from me with uh, proposals for the uh, restructuring of the senior management team and you agreed um, for me to go out uh, in con um, to uh, carry out statutory consultation with regard to those proposals. Uh, this report reports back to you the outcome of those consultations and amendments made to the proposals as a consequence of those. Of those. Um, I'm pleased to be able to report to you that the consultation process uh, was well received by the Council. We had a number of responses um, from um, Council officers uh, throughout the organisation uh, around the proposals and that those um, were constructive, supportive and helpful to, uh, to me in, in finalising the proposals back to you. Each, each uh, senior manager who was affected by um, these proposals has been um, consulted um, individually by me uh, and um, uh, the overwhelming response to me, whilst obviously our individual officers are personally affected, they supported the proposal, could see the sense behind it and recognised um, how important it was for the Council to move forward um, to address its future with a different uh, senior management structure than it had before. There were some helpful um, de detailed comments from individuals about particular things we were proposing to do um, where they felt that we could achieve more with slight amendments and those have been taken into account. They don't, they don't affect um, the, the sub substance of the proposals. Um, they were, for instance, there was um, a point made to me that in, um, in moving strategic transport un uh, under the rest of transportation, um, that, that had the effect of moving elements of planning transport uh, away from the planning service so I've, we've separated those things out so the planning elements of transport are staying with planning are going into the planning service and the rest of the transport is being amalgamated so very helpful comments on just in finessing particular issues so that was pleasing to see and it was good that people were thinking the structure through and, and, um, and helping me in that, in that, in that, uh, in that regard the, the consequence of um, the proposals as set out in um, paragraph 6.2 and 6.3 identify um, voluntary uh, 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 redundancy that would apply um, to two particular roles. Uh, the Assistant Director of Planning, Transport and Public Protection um, and the Director of Public Realm. In both circumstances, as a consequence of the consultation process, those um, officers um, requested um, voluntary redundancy. With the remaining uh, directly affected posts, the Director of HROD and Transformation, the Director of Strategy Engagement and Growth, 
and the Assistant Director of Regeneration and Place, um, those uh, roles uh, are, uh, will be affected in terms of compulsory redundancy notices, subject obviously to your decisions today. I think um, looking forward, um, again subject to the decision you make today, um, we have engaged um, Tyler Hill um, search, Executive Search Agency to work with us in order that we can um, um, uh, properly and effectively market the roles that we want to put out to the market uh, at this stage. The first tranche being the Exec Director of Corporate Services, the Chief Finance Officer, the Exec Director of Place and the Assistant Chief Executive. Um, Tyler Hill will work with us to, um, to use the best techniques that we can to present the council story to attract the right um, range of candidates. Um, we will also go into a slightly later phase for the assistant director post. Um, the hope and intention is that uh, we'll be in a position to, um, after you've appointed to the exec director roles, that those individuals, whilst they won't have started in the council, will we be able to be involved in any of the appointments that relate to their directorates. Perhaps it's a good ambition, whether we actually pull it off, we'll see, but that's how we would like to do it. Um, and I, again, I've covered that in the report. I think those are the main points, Chair. Obviously, happy to take questions and comments from members. Okay, thank you, Dr. Smith. Are there any members wishing to comment or question? No? Oh, um, Councillor Ken. Yeah, just a few comments. I, I broadly uh, welcome the, the, the report. I welcome the streamlining of the, the, the senior management team. I particularly welcome the reintroduction of the assistant chief executive role. I, th I think it's re re really important uh, and, and, and should should work. Uh, a, a couple of questions, I guess. You, you say that uh, strategic objective, one of the strategic objectives of the proposed structure is to increase the capability and capacity in the corporate core. Can you just explain how you think this will do that? Yes. Uh, in, in a number of ways. Firstly, by bringing together um, the, um, the, the corporate responsibilities around the uh, organised arrangements for the council, so things like our human resources services, our member and um, our member services, and so on, that we begin to integrate the way we we're approaching those things. Um, it's been very, it's been a very disaggregated system within Thurrock, which has not lent to to a consistent practice and the right arrangements for the provision of. Uh, resources and support in the right places in the council. So if, if I think about practical applications of this, at, at the moment I believe that the council is under-resourced in its support to members, uh, both, on, um, both in terms of servicing member uh, committees, but, but also in terms of providing member support in an advisory, in a, advisory capacity so that members can um, plan programs of work through the committees and implement them effectively, not just in the administration of those, but obviously that's important, but in providing members with the right level of professional support in applying those programs and reaching conclusions and then them being available to the rest of the council. And I think we can only achieve that if we're properly integrated as a corporate core. I'd say the same thing about our human resources arrangements uh, to ensure that the whole council works consistently in terms of the way it applies its human resource policies. They're just two examples, but that, that's what I'm che uh, seeking to do, Councillor Ken. Okay, that, that's helpful. Thank, thank you. Uh, f f further on, there's, there's a sentence that I just, just don't understand. It, it, it's, you, you say, to prepare the ground for further management cost reductions as the means of operating changes, as the means of, uh, as, as I say it out loud, I, I, I kind of Get, get, get what you're trying to say. Uh, 
d d does that indicate that there will be further reorganisation down the organisation in, in months to come? Uh, well, firstly, apologise if it's a bit cack-handed in the way I've, I've written it. It, uh, it absolutely means that. So the intention is that this is the first phase of change of what I think will be a number of phases over the next two or three years as the council uh, both reduces its scale uh, as a consequence of the financial challenges and also redirects its resources uh, into the areas uh, of work that are most important for the council um, to, um, to focus on. So, for example, um, in the discussions that we've been having, um, if you take the example I was using before, that one of the key issues that I think needs to be addressed uh, that comes through both the BVI um, report but also in the, in the discussions we've been having informally with elected members, there's a critical issue for me about um, the council recognising the, 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 the unique role of a local authority in that it's the only local public body that is, has democratic um, leadership representation and that, that legitimacy um, in, in both understanding and prioritising need and opportunity in the borough um, has to be well supported and that is the, the unique role of a local authority uh, given the role of elected members. And even though the council's reducing in scale and size, it can improve significantly in the way that we are supporting members to carry out that central function of a local authority to, um, to understand the needs and opportunities in, in the borough, to prioritise those and to, it, and to oversee um, the implementation of those actions, whether that's by the council itself or indeed its communities and partners. Thanks again, that's, that's helpful. Uh, the, the, the final one for me, from me, when it, when it comes to paying the, the one-off costs, uh, you, you talk of using kind of a mix of the transformation fund and capitalisation. Uh, first of all, and I don't particularly want an answer tonight, but can you just let me know how much is left in the transformation fund? That, 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 would, be, that would be useful to know. But capitalisation is, is in effect borrowing, isn't it? Uh, what, what do you kind of see as your preferred mix of current resources and borrowing to fund this? I think, I think to, the, to, the, to, um, to the greatest extent possible, we will use the, the one-off transformational resources that we've set aside rather than follow any other route. And I, th I, I think that's the most effective use of our resources. The, the difference we're trying to draw is we're not going to use those one-off available funds um, to underpin... Um, um, recurring revenue costs. So where we're going to focus the transformation resource is on those roles where we only need them for a specified period of time. The, the most obvious one, and I think one of the ones I draw attention to in the report, is in, is in what we refer to as the change team. So the change team is there not to provide long-term continuous improvement. It's there to drive the transformational level of change that we need to achieve in the first few years to, to meet our budget challenge and also meet the challenges of, of achieving the sort of change I was just outlining to you. The council does not need that intensive level of a change over an extended period of time. At a future stage of, um, a future stage of restructuring, a future phase of it, we will want to move from that model to one that ensures that members have available to them support to ensure continuous improvements to the council, the sort of things that you want to see year on year as an effective council. And that's the difference I draw, Councillor Kemp. Again, that's um, Councillor Warren. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, the first one was under the proposed structure. And the bottom paragraph, it's got a line that says, um, provide a clear focus for change management across the council through a multidisciplinary approach and a single line of sight on delivery and budget savings and operational change. What does that single sight... Could you just tell me more about what you meant by that? Because yes. I didn't understand it. Okay. The, 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 ch the challenge when you are trying to 
bring about very significant change at a very uh, quick pace is that we plan for it, but the execution of it becomes very dispersed and it's almost everybody's problem and nobody's problem. Um, and th there's always a risk when you're trying to work at pace. Um, uh, the, the, the budget's a very good example of this, as Councillor Snell will know. You, you, set, you set a budget in, in March and um, the implementation of that, those proposals was delayed because we weren't clear as officers about who was carrying out that work. So the intention is that, we, that there is a single point of... Um, uh, there's somebody you can look at in the eyes and say, you're ultimately responsible. Of course, I am ultimately responsible. Somebody on a day-to-day -day level is pursuing that, even though... Very, there are various actors who play part of it, and that's what the okay. point I'm trying to make. Okay, thank you. And on the restructure, so the proposed one, the new one, um, I just wondered, you know, if this is, and you talked about, you know, we'll maybe need to do this again further down the line. I just wondered if, do you think it's lean enough now? You know, have we done enough and, you know, stripped back enough at this level? Because I just I think maybe somebody at this level is possibly paid one role is enough for six roles further down the line, six road sweepers or whatever, you know. Like, so to have a hierarchy out there when people are looking at us and saying, oh, there's all them well-paid officers, you know, what does the top structure look like to what we're going to be sacrificing as we go down the food chain in work? It, it, it is as... It, at this stage, to develop and deliver for you the sorts of ambitions you have, as well as the challenges of intervention, it's my view you've got as thin a structure as you could as you could work. And the best way I can explain this to you is that, um, with the exception of the um, uh, assistant chief executive and the executive director of place. All the other roles are statutory roles. Okay. You've got a monitoring officer, you've got a Section 151 officer, and you've got a director of children's services and a director of adult services, and you've got a chief exec. Yeah. You, you can't operate with no. less than that. Um, the importance, obviously, you need a director of place. You, it's important. This council has ambitions about the, the borough. Um, I think what I've done is where you had two directors in, in the role, you divide it between public realm and uh, the sort of planning and economic development. I've merged those into one, which I think is an advantage to you because it, it helps you uh, it, and it helps the portfolio holders think about the borough as a, as a single place rather than the individual bits of services that support the place. So that's important to do. Yeah. And as Councillor Kent drew attention to at this stage in your development, redevelopment, having the assistant chief exec is that focus around change, yeah. if that's helpful. Absolutely, thank you. And my last question was again about, you know, Councillor Kent raised it around the transformation budget. You know, it's sort of littered all the way through every report that we're going to be relying on this one budget. So I think it is important that we do know how big that budget is, because every report says transformational, you know, yeah. budget. So I just, it's almost like we've got a tree somewhere that we're going to be able to pick this money <laughs> off, which we know is really not there. So, you know, for us to be paying for that out of that, you know, it's going to put a pressure elsewhere. And we'll make that information available. Absolutely. I haven't got the figures in my head. No, I, know, I don't expect that you do. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Spillman. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I... I mean, let's be frank, the way that we were, the position that we were in, it was hard not to argue that people were promoted to their level of incompetence, right? some of the decisions that have been made in this council. So mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that there's been a huge turnover. I appreciate that some of the architects are some of the worst decisions. They're now gone. And I also appreciate um, the speed at which you've carried out this process. I think it's good for the council. I mean, when I, when I heard the word consultation, I, I didn't think we'd be sitting here this early with what looks like everything signed and agreed. Um, 
I will ask, is there any, I know, is there any scope for um, grievance amongst the changes? Uh, would it result in a tribunal claim? Um, is, there, is there any scope for that? Are we sure that, that we've got that covered? That's my first point. Well, I'll ask Liz to comment uh, from a professional HR point of view in a second on that. My sense is that I, I have not detected anything in, in, in the way both our processes and the way people who are affected have um, engaged with me that would indicate that there's either an appetite to do that or, or that there's something that we've done profoundly wrong. Mm -hmm. As well as our own HR advice, I've also taken advice from, um, from the HR, senior HR uh, service within Essex as the, other, as the commissioner so that I could felt I was getting independent advice, uh, applying our own procedures, you know, it's still Thorpe's procedures, but I wanted a second set of advice to make sure there was a, absolutely nothing that we could do differently and so on. And so I, I've interrogated it as far as I can, Councillor Spillman, to feel that whilst you can never exclude yeah. every risk, but I've taken every measure I possibly can to ensure that we're as robust as we can. Uh, but I equally haven't, I have to say, I haven't had indica any indication from any of the affected people that they feel, um, who are here now, who, who feel that they've been unjustly um, treated. Is there anything you want to um, Yeah, I can just vouch for that the process has been very um, open. <laughs> has been very open. Um, we have followed our procedures, which were obviously written in accordance with employment and legislation. Uh, there is an appeal process um, on redundancies, so that would give us an indication if there was um, any kind of um, people being anxious about um, the outcome. Uh, but we, because we've been communicating with people so much, I, I agree that I doubt, I, I cannot see there being a risk. Um, but obviously we can never say never, but that would be my professional opinion. Uh, my second point is regarding what will be the headline figure in the, you know, on, on the street tomorrow. The, the narrative will be not around the change that this is going to bring to the organisation. It's going to be a, a it's going to be a seven figure narrative. What what words have you got? I mean, it's your opportunity now to say your piece on why you think that that expenditure is value for money for the residents out there? Um, I think I'd, I'd, I'd want to address that in, in several ways. For, for, firstly, and most importantly, when, you, when you're making changes of this nature, um, we, are, we have to recognise, um, it comes to your first point, really, Councillor Spielman, that we're dealing within legal parameters about how we handle change as, a, as an employer. And the, the most important thing from, from my point of view is that we follow employment law. And whilst we are clearly uh, leading to a position where we're reducing the number of senior managers and changing them, uh, we have responsibilities in law to the, to the people affected by that, which includes our... Includes following both the law and our own policies fairly consistently and equally uh, when dealing with those individuals, whoever they are in the organisation, however senior or junior. So the first and most important point from my point of view is that we deal with people on that basis. Um, and that's the approach that we've taken. Um, we, haven't, uh, we haven't done anything that we wouldn't do, either in process or financial terms, that would be any different from any employee within the organisation. Um, the, sec the second issue, from my point of view, is that um, uh, I think. think I mean, that's my point, really. It wasn't so much that I, you know you've chosen to spend a sum of money, which is which you which you can't change. Yeah. And you followed all the proper procedure. Yeah. How is that? How is that choice to spend that resource going to deliver a better result? and better taxpayer value for the people of Thorrock. Okay, so the, the, the second element is that, um, f first of all, in determining and recommending to you um, that uh, 
uh, voluntary um, severance schemes and um, payments through those processes, we are careful to evaluate the best value of, of that. So in other words, does that give a return of the council that means that ultimately we've saved the money? So a single payout is returned on a return on the terms of the reduction of the number of uh, um, posts and therefore the cost of those posts over time uh, within within principally within a three-year period and to meet that test is applied in separately uh, to those who are considering whether it's a good thing or not so there is a, a direct value for money assessment about whether it's good value for money to release that person under it under the severance scheme and uh, and we wouldn't put before you any any case that didn't meet that test so so that's just a hard calculation about is it value for money to let that person go. The second and perhaps um, um, additional point, which is not specifically only about the, the short-term effect of the money, is that we want, to, we want the council to have people who are capable of going to the next stage that the council needs to go. And they're not necessarily the skills of the people we've had those people had skills for a certain time in a certain environment. That's, we're, we're moving into a different time for this council and we need different skills from different people and therefore there is a real value in bringing those new people in even though there will be less of them, they'll come with a different uh, skill sets that should be able to provide you with the sort of support you need to achieve the goals that you've got going forward in the council. So it's a combination of direct value for money financially and impact on the quality of our ability to deliver your agenda for the, for the people of Thurrock. Any other member wishing to? Yeah, Councillor Maney. Thank you, Chair. I just have a question in relation to the um, Executive Director. This is for all. Sorry. <laughs> did you hear that? I did. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll just repeat it. It's in relation to the Executive Director of Corporate Services. That person's always also going to be the monitoring officer. Yeah. And they've got uh, five assistant directors under them. Yes. That's just looking for an assurance, really, that you don't think that director is too large. Uh, and also, um, a question in relation to the Assistant Director of Counter Fraud, Community Safety and Resilience. Could that not be one role amalgamated with the Assistant Director of, uh, of NATIS? Why have we got them as two two roles? Um, uh, thank you for your question, uh, questions, Councillor Maney. So, first thing re with respect to the Exec Director of Corporate Services, I, I think having that for, about the range of responsibilities that fall within it. I think, um, from my point of view, it's going to be extremely. Uh, important that the Exec Director for Corporate Services has available to them those range of services. I think it's a manageable range of resp response given that I expect Assistant Directors to operate properly at the Assistant Director level and it's not always been the case, uh, in my opinion, uh, that the Council's Assistant Directors have had the right spans of control uh, that they should be able to incorporate with under them. So this is a way of evening it out for me, and I think that is a doable position. I think we have a challenge about attracting somebody to, uh, to be the monitoring officer. Obviously, they are in short supply generally, but the way I'm trying to compensate for that is that the monitoring officer um, does not have to be legally qualified so long as the deputy monitoring officer is. So we've got that. We've kept that flexible and open to tr seek to apply um, to um, to be attractive to a range of people who have a, a, a an investment in good governance and good decision making without necessarily being a lawyer, and that's what we're trying to achieve. So having that range of services that support that task uh, is really important. Uh, with regard to the question of the those two roles. They're currently proposed to be separate at, at this phase because the council will have a decision at some point in the not too distant future about the future of Natis. As you will appreciate, Natis has grown uh, at, at some significant scale now and has a very large national role 
Um, and to the great credit of those ser that service, uh, has all sorts of relationships with uh, Whitehall departments in the delivery of its fraud responsibilities, which is far greater um, and not necessarily the same type of support fraud investigation that we need to do locally. So rather than lock us into something that in advance of a decision you'll need to make about the future of Natis and its relationship with the council, we, we decided at this stage to keep it separate. Any other member wishing to speak? No, so, um, so thank you, Dr. I think that anything I'd add is that, uh, you know, it's good to hear that um, after your consultations with officers, you know, whilst um, nobody likes change, they understand the reason for the change and, they're, they're, and uh, you know, they are supportive of it. Um, and just to echo um, what Councillor Spillman said as well, it's, it's really good that we're moving at speed with this so that we can get the council back onto the, the right footing. Sorry to interrupt you, Chair. There was just one uh, important point that I, I wouldn't want uh, not to draw to members' attention. So um, we are, I've made a specific recommendation of this, which is that we're, we're asking you to um, recommend to commissioners, because at this stage it's a commissioner's appointment, that, um, that Steve Mayer becomes the Section 151 officer in the interim. Um, at the moment, as you're aware... Um, Another officer plays that role in the council, who, who is well respected, um, and he, he may or may not judge in the future he wants to apply for the wider role. And uh, he agreed with me it's not appropriate for him to hold that role whilst we are advertising and, um, and seeking to open the market up to the future chief finance officer. So with his entire agreement, um, we think it's proper that we shift the section 151 responsibilities to the to the interim chief finance officer so um so that we're not impacting on the wider market but i just wanted to draw that to your attention and it's a recommendation you've been making to the commissioners who appoint during intervention the uh, 151 uh, role designate the 151 role in an officer Sorry to interrupt you. That's okay. No, thank, thank you for the clarification. Um, so if there's no more comments or questions from members, I'll move to the uh, recommendations. Um, so General Services Committee are asked to 1.1, to approve the final senior management structure. 1.2, to approve the voluntary redundancy request from the Director of Public Realm as set out in Appendix 3. 1.3, to note and approve the dismissals of the Director of HR, OD and Transformation and the Director of Strategy, Engagement and Growth through compulsory redundancy as set out in Appendix 3. 1.4, to note the recruitment and selection timetable for a senior position set out in Section 6. 1.5, to recommend to Commissioners the appointment of Stephen Mayer as, a one five, as the S151 officer pending the permanent appointment of a new Chief Finance Officer. Thank you very much. we we'll just take a pause while we wait for um, Jackie to come back into the, the meeting.
Okay, apologies to anyone listening online for the for the slight delay while we were just waiting for officers to return. So, item six, pay policy 2023-24, senior managers pay. Can I just remind members that appendices 3A, 3B, 4 and 5 are exempt, and should you wish to discuss those, we will need to go into exempt um, session. Can I ask Jackie Hinchcliffe, please, to present the report? Oh, oh sorry. Apologies. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, on, on the 27th of June, we brought a report to the General Services Committee, which had in it a, a number of options around the senior pay proposals. Um, those options um, contained information uh, and an evaluation of risk associated with each of those options, both the legal risks and, and wider risks and the impact of, of those risks. That, that we brought that report because um, as, as commissioners we were extremely concerned that, the, that the, the formal member oversight through committee um, had not been, uh, was not um, a practice that was embedded within this council over senior pay and that year on year senior pay had been um, determined um, simply by the council's uh, it, informal discussions, yes, and by the formal decision of the council on the senior pay, po uh, sorry, on the pay policy of the council. But the scrutiny and um, consideration of the issues associated uh, with um, the, both the pay policy and the contracts of employment of of senior managers had not been the subject of uh, open and transparent scrutiny um, by members and um, we felt that this was an omission that needed to be corrected. Um, the, that report of the 27th of June, as I said, evalu evaluated that there were risks associated with each of the options and set them out, inc including the risk of, um, of uh, action at, um, at tribunal level um, as of a breach of contract. Given the decision that General Services Committee made on the 27th of June, and, and particularly given the reaction of um, senior managers um, to that decision, which escalated the likelihood of um, s senior managers taking legal action, against the council, um, it, it um, led us to ask further legal questions about the likelihood of those um, actions being successful against the council. Um, that further legal action, uh, sorry, that further legal consideration identified, as is set out in the current report, um, that it is highly likely um, that uh, the tribunal would find in favour of the applicants and against the council, and that as a consequence of that, uh, we would face um, significant costs, reputational damage, and, and other issues that I'll come back to in a minute. The context for this is um, in this series of legal discussions that take place, both with regard to the first report and then this one is that is that Thorot Council operates a highly bespoke contract uh, of employment um, and a highly bespoke um, pay and reward system which has taken um, a substantial amount of legal advice both internal uh, external advice and ultimately council opinion to understand the obligations that are in there. Um, and it's only uh, through a series of um, um, discussions and analysis that it's led us to this point. Um, the, the impact for us of this um, and why the advice is now so strong to um, to um, to accept the position around the 4% um, is both in terms of the financial consequences of this, 
which is far and above the consequences of, of paying the 4%. Uh, the, the, the reputational damage this will do in terms of both industrial relations and also the consequences in terms of the intervention. And then most perhaps in some ways most problematic of all, uh, the damage it would do in terms of our ability to successfully attract um, good candidates to the roles uh, that we're seeking to fill at senior management level led us to feel that this needed to be brought back to you to, consider, to further consider in the, light, in the light of all those issues. I, uh, I absolutely um, um, clearly apologise to members that we've had to do it in this way. It's not what any of us would want it to have done. Um, but sometimes when you turn stones over and you start to dig into things and they um, are complex and difficult to understand, it's not always obvious to us um, how things are going to play out. It is a, it is a an unhappy but, but significant issue in any change programme at any level on any subject that things can get messy when you start to turn the stones over. But what I would want to reassure, reassure members about is that the whole process that we've been through and will continue to go through is intended to improve the council's ability to have control of, to have proper oversight and scrutiny and make decisions about matters that are related to it. And there can't be more, many more fundamental decisions to make as employers is about the employment of your staff and you have not been exercising that ability because of the way the system has worked up to now. Part of the recommendations that we brought to you given that we believe that we're not in a position legally and safely for you to exercise that judgment at this time given the nature of the contracts and the pay and reward system we currently have, it's why we've included in the recommendations, um, a, um, if you accept it and endorse it, an instruction on me to carry out a review to bring back to you proposals on um, uh, options for you about um, a different method of contracting and paying and rewarding that give you that proper control over what is happening that you can't exercise lawfully at the moment. Um, and um, uh, that we think um, as commissioners and obviously I would to say uh, as chief exec as well uh, that we think you should have. So again, I apologise for the circumstances but I've done my best to explain them to you and how, they've, uh, how they, we've come to this position but I'm seeking your support to ensure that the council can act responsibly given the legal position we're in, however unhappy that is at the moment, but also allow us to take action uh, to put that right through the options we subsequently bring back to you that will enable us to, uh, uh, to, to do things, to do two things, uh, amend uh, by negotiation the contracts of employment of existing senior managers and also, critically, ensure that the contracts of employment that we deploy for new senior managers is a system that you own and have control over. Thank you, Chair. Obviously, happy with questions and comments and so on. OK, thank you, Dr. Dave. Um, Councillor Spillman, you was the first one to put your hand up. I'm happy to say to the vice before me if he would like to speak first. OK, fine. Thank you very much. Um, now, excuse me for being sceptical. Um, the last months have hammered that into me. Um, my view is that you produced a half-baked report in June, then got an answer that ended up being problematic then got some more information that should have been provided to the committee at the time, panicked, and realised that you had to come back with this 
alternative proposal. I um, and, and then you've come up with two views of council um, that happen to agree with a 4% rise. Now, we're not going to discuss the merits of the pink papers, um, but I, what I will discuss is the initial paper, which said that a higher than national pay offer is likely to result in reputational damage if the council gives a higher level of increase than comparators in the majority of local authority. Strong possibility will be viewed by community and other stakeholders as a reward for organisational failures, which are likely to be perceived externally as, as attributable to both individual and collective leadership responsibilities. So, I mean, I won't express what I believe the views of the people in my ward of Ockenden are on this, because I'd probably be on some sort of charge if I did. Uh, I think I think that's absolutely clear. Now, I'm not going to be supporting this on a point of principle, but also because I don't think everything's been done, as is also in the advice that we got at this stage to exhaust every possibility of having a lower pay, pay order to senior staff. Now, I think that there should be a consultation with senior staff to accept a variation. I believe that this is... I, I, I'm appalled at this pay award, absolutely appalled by it, and I know that a lot of people will, will be. And, and I, I can't imagine, as a, pub, a public servant, considering, you know, in the position that they're in, with the experience they've got and the commitment they've had to public service, that there isn't a scope for a, that group of individuals to sit down and realise that this is fundamentally the wrong thing to do the wrong thing to do. And I would hope that we've got enough moral fibre in our CDL leadership team to accept that and come back to council with a voluntary position so that we can resolve what is an aberration. And that's my position, and that's why I won't be supporting you tonight. Because it is an aberration. It's an insult to the people of Thurrock, and it's an insult to the, the people whose services will be lost as a result of this extra pay. And that's my position. And um, just to respond to a few of those points, if, if I may, Chair, I think, I think the first and most important one is that, um, from my point of view, is that, um, that members wouldn't have been having this discussion before this year. And it, it's, uh, it's, it's the ability of the council to recognise that the change it's making leads to these discussions, including sometimes uh, difficult and challenging issues being brought to the table and discussed in a transparent and open way. So that's my first point. And that is a significant change from previously and is a demonstration that this council is moving on and that, and that things, however difficult, are being discussed. Secondly, um, from, 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 from my perspective, whilst respecting the position you take in representing your community, um, members also have a responsibility to the council and the council's functions and to ensure that, that we are doing what we have to do to ensure that the council is capable of operating effectively and being able to... Um, to explain to communities why we're having to take decisions we're taking, even when those decisions are, uh, are difficult for members of the community to accept or understand. And we are in that position in this General Services Committee in considering those circumstances. So uh, I'm disappointed that you feel that things have not moved on. I, I, I respectfully disagree with you on that issue. As I said to members... Uh, at the beginning when I opened this, I do apologise that this, is, this has been led to this process instead of being able to resolve it at the first instance. I do think that is as a consequence of the circumstances we're in, the complexities that I outlined about understanding such a system that Thorough currently has, which I have never seen in, in the uh, 
in the almost 20 years I've been a chief executive in, lo in local authorities, I have never seen anything like this before. So um, I, I'm not surprised it's taken us um, some while and some difficulty in understanding those issues. Of course, it's in everybody's interest, yours and, and mine, that this should have been um, seen and understood right from the beginning, but it plainly wasn't. And uh, it wasn't for the reasons I said. Um, and I want to, to reassure all members that that is the circumstances. I would ask that, that we, we make some sort of amendment where you go back to senior staff and say, for instance, do a consultation on them accepting voluntarily accepting a lower pay increase and around the 2% level. That would be something that I would be happy with. And, and I think that you owe it to the taxpayers of Thorrock to at least make that effort at this stage. And it's something that is within the, the council recommendations as well, that, that we've had from council. It's in there. It's the last line. Yeah? It's, it's in the advice we've got that that can be done. So I would ask that this is done before we make a decision on that. It... it, it uh, and I'll, I'll seek legal advice on, on this, but my understanding is it does, that does not negate your responsibilities as an employer. And um, not, not making the decision you need to make and that, uh, in order to consult uh, would put people in the position um, where, in effect, we're breaching, already breaching our contract of employment responsibilities. Okay. So it's... Well, that's so. So, the, my point, and I did say, well, I'll ask whether we're able to answer that question legally. Uh, but my concern that I'd want to be as, uh, addressed uh, is that we're not putting in our posi position where, in effect, um, the consultation is not a proper consultation because we are failing already to to deal with our legal responsibilities. But, I, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask whether we're able to answer that question. So, whether we are... Um, sorry, could I just... Um, could you clarify what you're asking? I, I would ask for a volunteer, for, um, for senior managers to put in writing, as is an option laid out by one of the council that we employed, that they would agree to a variation in the, the pay um, award. That's what I would ask for to reduce the pay award on a voluntary basis across the senior management. I would like a consultation on that with senior management because I think they need to do the right thing. Okay, but to not, um, the, the, the legal advice is that to not pay them the increase in line with the review that's been undertaken um, would amount to a breach of contract. We can't discuss the pink papers, no. so that's really difficult. So I'd like to closed session so we can discuss the pink papers if you're okay. Yeah. So we now need to go into closed session, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So we're now back into um, public session again and we are uh, about to make a decision on the recommendations. So I'm going to read them out. So General Services Committee are asked to 1.1, note the recommended senior pay manager pay award of 4% as determined and by the independent assessment with effect from the 1st of April 2023. 1.2 is to recommend the revised pay policy statement incorporating the 4% award to council. Agreed. Against. And 1.3, instruct the Chief Executive as part of a wider pay review to bring back to General Services Committee a review of pay and arrangements for determining ongoing annual pay awards for senior managers. Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, we, we now need to move into exempt session again. I'm going to stop the meeting now because we're going to Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay.